Hello and welcome, Soul Sisters. Uh, I know you're probably wondering, who is this woman and how did she get in here? Uh, well, my name is Veronique Weber and my husband Matt and I are here in LA um, by way of Boston to visit our parents, Doug and Joanne. And um, yeah, we're here to visit family, but honestly, we were in need of a quick rescue because we are, like I said, in Boston, we have our son MJ, who is four, our daughter Jillian, who will be three in just a few days, but she's going on 33. Um, and honestly, we just needed a break. <laughs> we needed some help. So we came out to LA because our parents are wonderful and have offered to just help us out and uh, spend great time with their grandkids. Um, so it's been wonderful being here. My husband and I got to go to Yosemite and spend some time together there. and. Of course, we got a report that our children who have not been sleeping through the night slept 12 hours, 13 hours when they were with their grandparents. So we're thinking that we're the problem and we may just leave them here for a little bit because they seem to be thriving out here in California. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that with us being back in Boston, you know, I have two careers, we have two little kids. It was just very hectic, so it's been wonderful uh, being here with Doug and Joanne and, and Cameron. And so I am grateful to Michelle and Joanne for allowing me to share with you today. Uh, and I don't know about you or anybody else, but I have a word of the year every year. And my word this year is cast, as in cast your anxiety on God because he cares for you. But last year, and I know we don't like to speak about 2020, but last year in 2020, uh, my word was self-discipline. And um, I was realizing that, like I said, with two careers, two little kiddos, uh, I was really neglecting my, my health. I was really neglecting um, just myself. And I was calling eating the ends of peanut butter and jelly on the way to the trash. I was calling that lunch. And so I realized that I needed to take some time to address my body, my health, and um, to get better rest and all these things. So going to the gym and doing all these cleanses and it was great because I was changing a lot of things. But you know, what is interesting is that all these physical things I was changing did not compare to what God was gonna show me later in 2020 about the spiritual things that I needed to change at the soul level. Um, and that's what I wanna share with you today, the changes that God brought to my attention um, within the soul. And uh, you know, just a disclaimer, this subject is very raw for me. <laughs> As I said, I just realized a lot of this in 2020. So it, it's not a strength of mine. I am definitely sharing something that I am in right now with God. God is holding my hand and leading me through this right now. Uh, so just for a little bit of back background, in 2009, I was 22. I was a Christian for almost three years. St just started dating my husband just a few weeks <laughs> uh, before all of this took place that I'm gonna share. Uh, I moved on a mission team to help plant a church in Clemson, South Carolina. I just graduated college. And on top of all that, I lost my father uh, to a stroke. And I felt a pain that I, I literally had no words to communicate. Uh, I didn't know how to share it, how to talk to people about it. All I knew is that I never wanted to feel this way again. So 22 year old me uh, took some steps to protect herself from this kind of pain. I uh, built up walls. And in a word, I tried to gain control um, of pain in my life, how much pain I let in my life. Uh, and I know control is an illusion, but it's my favorite illusion. Uh, so basically I was telling God, hey, I'll take it from here. I trusted you, you took my father. Um, so I got it right now. And, um, and we can do this right. Sometimes when we're hurt, we start to question, like, does God love me? Is he really in control? Um, are his plans really good? And we don't often do all of this questioning um, out loud. We may come to church still and put on the face of a good Christian and um, seem surrendered and seem content. But honestly, at a soul level, we're, we're questioning God and we're trying to uh, take control of our lives in certain ways. And so, and I know it doesn't make sense, but when you have a broken heart, you do some really irrational things. And so fast forward 11 years, uh, it's 2020 and God finally gets me to be still. I mean, I went from mission team, getting married, moving, having kids, starting a career, grad school, all these things. And I so I feel like for 20, in 2020, uh, just like for a lot of us, God put us in time out. He put billions of people in time out. And we had this time for maybe the first time in a long time to really reflect 
on our lives. And um, what God was really showing me is that these walls that I built up in 2009 were still there 11 years later. I had no idea, um, but they were still there. And uh, he was trying <laughs> to show me that I was attempting with my human hands to protect myself in a way that only he could, only God could. Um, and some over here leading churches, having babies, uh, became a speech therapist. I'm shepherding others. Um, yet I never had taken the time to address some deep hurt that I've been dealing with at a soul level. And uh, this was hard for me to admit and accept uh, and realize where I was. And so I felt like I got the wind knocked out of me. Honestly, I felt ashamed, confused. Uh, you know, I prided myself on loving others. It's one of the things that I feel like I do okay, you know, kind of well. I just love giving my heart to people. Um, and, but God was trying to reveal to me that, you know, there were specific ways that I had shut one of my most important relationships out of my life, my husband, in order to protect myself. And I was doing this before we were even married um, and not really even aware of it. But I allowed myself to pull away, to show less love. Uh, and it, what it came down to it is I was fearful of losing my husband the way that I lost my father. And uh, I still can get triggered in that when I, you know, we turn on the news and we see these tragic mass shootings. I think, you know, I could lose him while he's going to the grocery store to pick up some eggs. You know, it's, it terrifies me. And um, so, you know, there's a thing about walls <laughs> that in our attempt to keep out the bad, we really prevent the good from getting in as well. And, you know, my husband was loving me fully, freely, um, but I wasn't allowing myself to reciprocate that because I just kept thinking, you know, I need to stay whole, be whole so I can carry on, so I can be okay, so I can provide, you know, for myself and now for my kids if something happens to him. And, you know, it was just, I just kept seeing my mom and I didn't mention this earlier, but, you know, within a year and a half, not only did I lose my father, but I lost um, both of my mother's parents. So, you know, within a year and a half, my mom lost her husband and her mother and her father. And it was horrible to watch her go through that. And I think at that young age, I kept thinking, you know, not me. I got to be strong, got to be strong. And we can we can do that. We can, you know, tell ourselves that we have to be something that not even God is telling us that we need to be. And, you know, God really wants us to operate out of a uh, hundred percent of love because we're created in his image and that's what he does. Uh, we're designed to live life to the full, not being fearful or guarded. And so, you know, little small things of me pulling away and trying to protect my heart uh, became really big things that became obvious to my husband. And so I knew that I needed to change, but immediately I tried to take over and do that myself. I began to look for ways to fix it. I began to, uh, you know, try to use my own efforts. And after a while of doing that, I realized that God wasn't looking for me to change it. He wanted me to allow him to change it for me. You know, he was watching me get well in all these physical areas, you know, my eating and all these things, but he knew um, that it would amount to nothing if my soul wasn't well. And so, you know, I, I mentioned this to my mentor and I was asked to read Psalm 23 and boom, you know, pride <laughs> just got in there. Um, because this is one of the first scriptures that I memorized when I was 12 years old at church. And so I was like, what can Psalm 23, you know, teach me? You, this is something that children just kind of recite. <laughs> but, but, you know, I turned to this scripture in the Bible and you can almost hear the laughter from heaven because when I opened the Bible, I really heard the shepherd's voice. And in Psalm 23, you know, that first line, God says, the Lord is my shepherd, you know, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so when I read down a little bit in my study Bible, I saw these words. It says, sheep are completely dependent on the shepherd for provision, guidance, and protection. The New Testament calls Jesus the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. As the Lord is good, as the good shepherd, so we are his sheep, not frightened or passive animals, but obedient followers, wise enough to follow the one who will lead us in the right way. This psalm does not focus on the animal-like qualities of sheep, but on the discipleship qualities of those who follow. And those words that the sheep rely on the, on the shepherd for provision, guidance, and protection. The very things that I was trying to do for myself and not allow God to do. Needless to say, I got up, I closed the Bible, I left the room because 
you know, and knowing me, I probably wanted to go clean something, just something to distract myself because this was a bomb that was just dropped in my life. You know, I was really cut to the heart, I was broken, um, but I was so grateful for that wake up call because I could have, it could have been another 30 years before I read this and realized that I was not allowing God to shepherd me. I was trying to shepherd myself. Um, but I know that God gives us what we can handle in perfect timing. And for me, 2020 was that perfect timing where I was able to finally be still and realize that God was asking me to allow him to shepherd me. Um, and I had to truthfully answer these questions. Is the Lord my shepherd? And if not, then what is shepherding me? And so that caused me to dig deeper at a soul level. And, you know, one of the hallmarks of a shepherd's relationship with his sheep is that they know the shepherd's voice. And Jesus even speaks about this in a very real and uh, phenomenon in scripture. He talks about this in John 10, uh, verse 27. And we'll read that. It says in John 10, verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So this isn't just, you know, something that we see out in nature. This is biblical as well. And, you know, I had this video that I wanted to share and I hope you guys can go look on YouTube for it. I didn't want to, you know, deal with copyright, but it's incredible. It is a video of uh, a few different people trying to call this herd of sheep. And so the shepherd is saying, go on, try, you know, say these words, call them and see if they come. And then person after person tries to call the sheep and they don't even look up. They don't even realize that they're being called. And then all of a sudden the shepherd comes out and he calls them. They perk up. They start walking over it and he calls them again and they start running towards their shepherd because they know his voice. And, you know, this makes me emotional every time because sheep are so obedient and they know the voice of their shepherd. You know, if you put three different herds of sheep in one pen, but you know, just one shepherd comes to call, only his sheep will follow him. That's how obedient they are. They know their shepherd's voice. You know, and sheep get a bad rep for being dumb, <laughs> but honestly, they're just so obedient and shepherd reliant. And that is literally my, my job description for the rest of my life is to be shepherd reliant and not sheep reliant. Um, but they, they do whatever um, the shepherd says that they don't appear to be thinking for themselves because they're so reliant on their shepherd. And um, I think for me, it, it's, it's crazy because I remember hearing about this in the Bama podcast. The, the sheep will literally jump off of a cliff if they think they hear the shepherd's voice coming from that side of the cliff. And we can think I, that sounds crazy. I don't want to do that. I don't want to jump off a cliff, but we can really do that metaphorically in so many ways when it comes to sin. We jump off of cliffs for sin all the time, uh, but at least God will be there to catch us when we're, when we're following his voice. Uh, Satan would just watch us fall and uh, start laughing. Uh, but the reality is if our shepherd is not God, then it's something or someone else. And so I asked you this question, what did 2020 reveal for you? I'm sharing about some of the things that God was showing me, you know, in 2020 for myself, but you know, maybe there's something that he revealed to you in 2020. I have a friend that likes to say 2020 was a, a test run for Jesus coming back because we realize we're not in control. Things can change in just any moment. But when that happens, it kind of reveals some things in our character. I think all of us saw some things in our character last year that we didn't feel so proud about, not so great about. Um, and this was the thing for me. But he uh, God really revealed things we all need to grow in. Uh, but, you know, there are things you could be led by instead of God. Maybe the news is your shepherd. Social media is your shepherd. And you can tell that because maybe you're one way when you open your phone and by the time you're done scrolling, your whole mood has changed. So it's shepherding you, telling you how you should feel. Maybe fear, like me, maybe fear was your shepherd. Worry, anxiety, your emotions, demands at home, demands at work, the craziness of work now being at home. You know, all of these things, you know, really could just well up in us and cause us to start listening to something other than God. And for me, really, it was me listening to my own voice. And sometimes our own voices can be so critical and, and unkind. And um, I can, in the end of the day, bury myself with all of these shoulds. You know, you should be able to get out of bed. You're not sick. <laughs> things aren't that bad. Your house should be clean. You know, what are you doing? You should be more faithful right now. You should be having school with your kids every day and teaching them memory scriptures. You should have learned a new hobby with all this time that you've been spending at home. 
You should be a better speech therapist by now. You should be stronger than this spiritually. You should have overcome this in your marriage by now. You should be more rested. You've been at home all day. Your daughter should be potty trained. She should be sleep trained. Uh, she should be eating more. You should not be afraid of her, but I am afraid of her. I told you she was three going on 33. You have to meet her, I promise you. You'd be scared too. Um, but in a matter of minutes, you know, I could really should myself to death and just be buried of, you know, under all these things that I'm thinking instead of listening to the shepherd's voice. And so what would God say to us if we were listening to his voice? You know, he would say, wow, so much, but you're unique. You're loved. You are special. You are cared for. You are lovely. You're precious. You're strong. You are important. You are forgiven. That's a big one. You're protected. You don't have to do it yourself. You're chosen. And you are my family. I mean, that's, it's clear right there why we should be listening to God's voice over our voices. You know, we're not that kind to ourselves, but God reminds us of the truth about ourselves. And so God's voice has to be the loudest voice in our heads. You know, when you learn to listen to God's voice, you learn to love exactly who he created you to be, your unique, authentic, and organic self. So how do sheep do this? How do they learn to listen to the shepherd's voice? Well, when they're just a lamb, they just follow the flock. <laughs> you know, they do what all the sheep ar around them are doing. Uh, so it's like they're borrowing trust and faith from those in their community, surrounding yourself with those who will speak truth to you when you don't even know what to listen for. And so one way I've done this in um, my life recently is by starting a group in my region in Boston called Don't Mom Alone. And it's taken from a, a, a podcast that I listen to. And we meet every Monday at four o'clock. We may listen to a lesson. We may come with just a topic, whatever it may be. But we just a group of women, we get together and there's been visitors from California. We have three women that come from Canada. We have I mean, it has grown tremendously, but it just started from I know I need community. I know that I don't know what I'm doing parenting in a pandemic. I need help from other women. And it's amazing because we sit around and we cry and we encourage each other and we remind each other of who God says we are. We remind each other of the shepherd's voice. And so that's one way that, you know, the sheep do it. They listen to the other sheep around them. They follow them. And I know Joanne, my, my mother-in-law, she mentioned this in her talk, her soul sister talk, just about the importance of friendship. I call it her purple hat talk, but just the importance of community and having people around us. And so as sheep grow, they, their experiences with their shepherd, that helps build their trust. They know who feeds them, protects them, who cares for their needs. So why would they follow anyone else? You know, they know who is going to be making their provisions. And we know this as well. If we can just rely on our own experiences with God, know that even in the hard times, God quieted the storm. If we rely on those experiences to teach us, we know that we can remain obedient to the one that's been faithful to us, the same way the sheep were obedient to the one that's been faithful to them. And so, however, <laughs> sheep are not the only animals that the shepherd cares for. The Bible speaks often about sheep and goats together. And so, uh, you know, in, real, in the real world, they're herded together because they do different things. They provide different things. You know, sheep provide the wool, goats provide the milk. Um, and it's more time effective to just herd them together because they're not in conflict with one another. Uh, but there are so many differences between these two animals. And we already know that the sheep listen to their shepherd's voice, but goats, goats are self-reliant wanderers. They stroll about doing their own thing and obedience is nowhere in their vocabulary. So although they appear to be a part of the shepherd's flock, they don't listen to the shepherd's voice. And uh, that cut me <laughs> because I feel like that can so easily be me sometimes. I can appear like I'm a part of the flock. I can appear to be a sheep but I'm not listening to the shepherd's voice. I am self-reliant and wondering. And so, which are you? Sheep or the goat? We are, we're all one or the other and we can switch sometimes, but it's good to identify which one we are. Are we a sheep or are we a goat? And so you can see that all this is from the first verse <laughs> in uh, Psalm 23. 
And so it's incredible if we dig deeper just how much we can, can find from this. And so I just want to share, you know, one more thing about this, this part of the psalm that I was missing this whole time. And it was the concept, this concept that, that God is painting here of just enough, you know, that he provides just enough. Uh, and in Psalm 23, verses two through three, it says, he make me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the quiet waters. And that sounds pleasant <laughs> to me. If you ask me, that sounds incredible. But, you know, from our point of view, when we think about green pastures, we think about just this lush land with green grass, this, this baby sheep just lying down, uh, you know, in there. And there's no worry. There's just abundance. There's grass as far as the eye can see. But, you know, if, if you are a Hebrew reading this scripture, then you would know that that is not what the terrain looks like. <laughs> that would not be what a pasture looks like to you. Um, actually, they look more like this. It was barren. And it's incredible because God provides just enough humidity in the air within the desert that just little droplets of waterfall and they provide just these little tufts of grass. And so when we think about this green pastures, it's, it's desert. It's not just this lush <laughs> field uh, that we would see at a park, it's desert. And it's, it's incredible because the sheep don't have the luxury of depending on their sight. They're not depending on what they can see. They're depending on the shepherd to lead them to just enough, just enough for one bite and just enough for one sip. You know, these still waters, it's not this rushing ocean, you know, that we we get to think about or this lush, you know, uh, meadow with this water that goes through it. It's these little like pockets of water for just one sip, just enough. And that's what the shepherd does. He leads them to just enough. So in the desert, you know, that we learn that the shepherd gives you exactly what you need for right now. Ten minutes from now, you trust the shepherd. Ten years from now, you trust the shepherd. We are not in control of the pasture or the journey, but we can control our trust for the shepherd. So a rabbi once said, worry is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture. God hasn't provided tomorrow's pasture yet. And we're already worried about it. You're borrowing sorrow from the future. And that's what I was doing in my situation, borrowing sorrow from this future of losing my husband and you know, having to go through all the things I saw my mom go through. You know, God reveals only what we need to know right now. Any more would overwhelm us, like utterly overwhelm us. So we have to be women that live by, that, you know, don't live by sight, <laughs> like the sheep don't live by sight, but instead they, they live by the shepherd's voice. We have to be hearers and not relying on what we can see because sometimes what we see around us is not encouraging at all, but what we hear is always encouraging. And here's even more evidence that God wants us to be women of the ear and not the eye. Second Corinthians five, verse seven, you know, living by faith, not by sight. Philippians four, verses 11 through 13. And Paul describes this, the secret of being content in any situation. And that secret is that he leaned on God's strength and not his own. He was not being a goat and doing his own thing. He was being a sheep. And that's how he was able to be content. You know, trusting and following God allows us to say, it's well with my soul. Not because we trust in what we see, but in whose voice we hear. We have everything we need uh, because we have Jesus. And I want to recommend this incredible book that I've been reading to really help me to dig deeper in, in the 23rd Psalm. And it's Safe in the Shepherd's Arm arms by Max Lucado. And I want to read a little excerpt from this book because it really hits this point home about just enough. And it says, you have a God who hears you, the power of love behind you, the Holy Spirit within you and all of heaven ahead of you. If you have the shepherd, you have grace for every sin, direction for every turn, a candle for every corner and an anchor for every storm. You have everything you need. We have just enough because we have Jesus. So in conclusion, you know, the struggle to listening to the shepherd more than our own voice and trusting him, regardless of what we see or don't see, it's ultimately illustrated in the story of Martha and Mary in Luke 10, 
uh, verses 38 through 42. And, you know, it's the story of Jesus coming to the home of Martha and Mary and they're trying to get preparations for him. And uh, and of course, they take two different directions once they see Jesus. Once Jesus is there, Mary takes to his feet. She sits at his feet to listen to him, to learn from him, to take in the moment. Martha's still in the kitchen trying to get things done. And I know Martha gets a bad rep, but we are all Martha. I would definitely be Martha in the kitchen. I know this because I do this when people come to my house. They're there and I'm still trying to finish some last minute preparation. So instead of, you know, stopping and being with people, enjoying the moment, I'm still so stuck in all the busyness and life will always demand so much of us. Each moment provides new worries. I mean, 2020 showed us that full well. And, you know, with all this going on in the news right now, we can't even go to the grocery store, the movie theater, the spa, even church without some fear. Coronavirus, guns, etc. But it's all around us. But however, worry and self-reliance only makes it worse because it doesn't change anything. And it actually distracts us from what's best, which is sitting at the feet of Jesus and allowing him to shepherd us. And, you know, I was choosing to be worried about many things, just like Martha. And it distracted me from loving my husband the way that God wanted me to and from allowing me to, uh, you know, have God shepherd me through those fears in my life. And so God wants us to rest in him, to be led by him, to listen to him and to choose what's best every day by choosing him. And how do I know this? Because of Psalm 23, it says he refreshes my soul. God wants our souls to be refreshed and we can only have refreshed souls by allowing him to shepherd us. He wants to refresh our souls and that's amazing and it's so needed. He doesn't want us to be run down, lost, <laughs> playing out of our position, exhausted. He wants you to lay down the burdens you were never meant to carry and to cast them on our shepherd because he wants us refreshed. I was never meant to pick up those burdens at 23. I'm not meant to pick them up today either. You know, God wants to carry that hurt, that fear for us. And so what areas of your life do you need God to restore or to refresh? Is it your faith? Is it stale? Do you need to brush off the cobwebs, cobwebs of evangelism? Uh, I'm reading this book right now, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. And he says, you're not a 22 year old Christian. You're a one year old Chris Christian 22 times. And that could be us sometimes when we lack repentance, we lack maturity, we don't grow because we're trying to do things our, ourselves instead of putting it in God's hands. And so sometimes we need restored hope, restored vision, restored direction, restored energy, a restored soul. God is restoring my soul right now. He's helping me to break down these walls right now. And he can do it for you too. He wants this for you right now. Not after COVID is cured or after your house is clean or after you run these last three errands or the homework is done or you get your life together, whatever that means. Uh, after the kids go to, to school, after you finish this last deadline, not after all of these things. He wants it for you right now. But first we have to identify who our shepherd is. We have to rejoice in our role as his sheep by being obedient to his word. And if you think you're a goat right now, it's okay to switch teams. It's not too late. You can do it right now. But we, he wants us to be convinced that just enough is more than enough. And we need to trust our ears more than our, eye, our eyes so we can be well with our soul. So I want to encourage you. You know, your circumstances may not change, but you can change. You can allow God to change you. So take time, please, to read and to sit with and to meditate on Psalm 23 in its entirety. We only went over a few verses, but think about how much we got from just those three verses. There's so much more there. Take a verse a week, memorize it, read different translations, but ask God to help you live it. And even consider buying these books. I mentioned the Max Lucado book. There's so many other books about Psalm 23 that help you deepen your understanding. But ultimately we wanna ask God to show us where are we not allowing him to shepherd us in our lives? And as I said in the beginning, I am currently on this journey. I am still figuring it out. And I was really reluctant to even share it because I usually like to, you know, read all the books, have all the insight, have all the wisdom, have it all together. But God told me, share it is just enough. What you have now is just enough and he'll take it the rest of the way. And I'm excited for the future because, you know, God has already given me a beautiful marriage. 
but I, I just can't imagine. I'm excited to imagine how much more it will grow when I allow God to guide me, when I put my trust in him instead of my fears. And imagine how that would transform your life as well. Everything in life hinges on this. If we get this, we have true freedom. And there is so much more on the other side of our walls, on the other side of our fear. And so ladies, soul sisters, <laughs> God wants sheep. He wants you with all your hurts, all your fears, all the shortcomings, all the doubts, all the shoulds. He's the same shepherd on the days when you're too defeated to get out of bed and on the days when somehow you get your whole to-do list done. He wants it all. In the shepherd's care, all will be well with your soul. Thank you for having me and for letting me share, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.